This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news compiled in the early hours of the morning on Tuesday the 30th of May. I'm Emilio San Pedro with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, the French President Emmanuel Macron has told the Russian leader Vladimir Putin that any use of chemical weapons in Syria will provoke retaliation from France. Mr. Macron also said the two leaders had aired their disagreements. We shared our disagreements, but at least we shared them. And above all, we see how we might, in a concrete manner, build a common approach. Also in the podcast, at least 11 people have died in Moscow, following what the authorities there describe as a rare but severe thunderstorm. A presidential hopeful in Kenya has been charged with attempting suicide after he was told his candidacy had been rejected. And later, the American golfer Tiger Woods has been arrested for drink driving in Florida. Apparently, he was at a party or having a good time with his friends. The police arrested him. All these things happen after 3 a.m., and I don't know what the circumstances were that caused it. But first, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, has told his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, that it must be their common priority to find a political roadmap in Syria to combat the threat of terrorism. We shared our disagreements, but at least we shared them. And above all, we see how we might, in a concrete manner, build a common approach. If we don't have a frank, sincere dialogue, which of course will sometimes include disagreements, but one that is demanding on both sides, we won't make any progress, either on the matter of Ukraine nor on the Syrian question, to mention only those two. We'll get the Russian view in a moment, but first to our correspondent in the French capital, Hugh Schofield. What they did was agree to construct a new relationship, but it was left in the vaguest possible terms. Um, the underlying tone of the meeting was realism. Um, both countries know that there are deep, deep disagreements on Ukraine and on Syria, and they were brought up in their talks and they were brought up at this press conference. But um, the intention, it seems, of both countries, of both leaders, is to go beyond that and to talk frankly to each other and to put the relationship back on some kind of even keel so that where there are points of convergence, um, something can be made of it. And they both seem to feel that on Syria there are areas where they can cooperate. It's all been left in very, very vague terms, but uh, I think the feeling is that this is a turning point in French-Russian relations after a very, very bad period. And, and Mr Macron in his inauguration address said the world needed a strong France. He seems, from his demeanour with President Trump at the G7 and the NATO summit and now with uh, President Putin, he also did seem to strike a quite uh, determined tone, even if they were trying to find some areas of agreement. It was completely. I mean, his whole body language, his whole purpose, sense of purpose is about returning France to its rightful place, you know, among the leading nations of the world. And we, we saw that um, with the Trump handshake and we saw that today. I mean, he's, he's had a very intensive round of diplomatic meetings in the last few days, out of which he has, I think, in, in domestic terms, reinforced. He certainly acts with incredible, you know, or surprising, shall we say, aplomb and the self-assurance of a man of his young age. But he is a figure who we know intrigues, fascinates around the world and has, in a sense, reset the international balance because of who he is and, and what he's pushing for, which is for a new France and a new Europe. We'll have to see if it goes anywhere, but that's certainly his intention. Also in Paris is our correspondent Oleg Boldirev from our Russian service. I asked him how the meeting is being viewed in Russia. Well, I think the Russian media have changed their tune, started calling Mr. Macron a pragmatic just what exactly is meant is unclear. And if you remember a while ago, they were calling Mr. Trump pragmatic, hoping that suddenly there will be some new openings. Certainly no one is talking about sudden dramatic new openings now. And I think the best uh, the joint press conference could offer is just a hope uh, and a feeling that the things were not so chilly as, for example, a joint press conference of Mr. Putin and Angela Merkel uh, almost a month ago when he was hosting her in Sochi. Back then, it was quite clear that the two leaders spoke, spoke frankly, couldn't find any solutions. This time around, the speeches were, sh were shorter. And I think Mr. Putin, uncharacteristically, spoke almost nothing about Ukraine, 
a little bit more about Syria. But Mr. Macron did not uh, mince words either, did he? He was quite strong in his views on Syria and Ukraine and, and willing to show that he doesn't agree with Mr. Putin. Yes, that's certainly he didn't hide. And he said that, you know, we've been frank. Uh, we found what the differences are. Uh, he said that he's having his red lines at, for example, using chemical weapons in Syria, at not giving access to humanitarian operations in Syria. Mr. Putin preferred to talk about his favorite subject, that the war on terror must not turn into a war on, uh, on the head of state, uh, he meant uh, Bashar Assad. Uh, but I think uh, Moscow at this point can give Mr. Macron some leeway and can afford not to notice this. And, and frankly, uh, th there could be more disagreement and there could be a more barbed formulas, which in this expression in the first press conference did not appear. A lot was made when Mr. Macron met Donald Trump about the battle of the handshakes and the way uh, Macron moved in and really shook hands uh, extremely firmly with President Trump. Who won out this time around, would you say? Oh, I watched as President Putin shook hands with Mr. Macron. Uh, Putin's handshake is described as pretty strong but pretty brief. There is no tugging and no pulling. Uh, so I think it was businesslike but very short. Uh, we shouldn't judge on this particular subject. Oleg Bolderev in Paris. Health officials in Russia say 11 people have died in a violent storm that swept through Moscow. More than 50 people are reported to have been injured. Our correspondent Steve Rosenberg sent this report from the city. Moscow today witnessed the destructive power of nature. Gale force winds lashed the Russian capital, ripping up hundreds of trees, blowing down power lines and advertising hoardings. There were reports of roofs blown off buildings. Several people have been crushed to death. Dozens of others have been injured. The Moscow Weather Center's chief specialist, Tatyana Posnikova, told me that in places, wind speeds had approached 70 miles an hour. The results, she said, of a cold front moving in from the northwest and mixing with hot air. Such a gale, she said, was extremely rare for Moscow. The last time this city experienced anything similar was in 1998. Back then, nine people were killed. Moscow's mayor expressed condolences to the families and friends of today's victims. Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. A would-be candidate for the Kenyan presidency has been charged with attempting suicide after he was barred from standing in the election. Peter Solomon Gichira has denied the charges. Alistair Lethet has the details. Peter Gichira had hoped to win popular support as a presidential candidate, but few Kenyans had heard of him before he was charged with attempting to commit suicide. It's a quirk of law, left over from British colonial times, a misdemeanour punishable by up to six months in prison. Mr Gachira denied trying to throw himself off the Electoral Commission's sixth-floor balcony after being told his presidential ambitions had been thwarted by bureaucracy. He also denied destroying property and creating a disturbance by breaking a window and was released on bail. Alistair Leithhead. The British Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, has welcomed a decision by the security service MI5 to investigate how it deals with information from the public in light of the Manchester attack. It's emerged the security service received warnings about Salman Abedi's extremist views. Earlier, detectives released an image of the bomber with a suitcase as they tried to trace his movements in the days before the attack, just over a week ago. Here's our home affairs correspondent, Emma Vardy. Salman Abedi was reported to authorities by members of the local community at least three times in the five years before the suicide attack on the Manchester Arena. The BBC understands concerns were raised by individuals, including an imam, after Abedi spoke about suicide operations and dying for a cause. The Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, has said security services must now review what judgments were made and what actions were taken as a result. This is an ongoing investigation, so I'm not going to be drawn into comments about the actual man who committed this crime. But I do think it is right that MI5 take a look at their processes to ensure that they work to the best of the possible limits to make sure that we keep people safe. The Home Secretary has also confirmed that powers to prevent terror suspects returning to the UK have been used only once. Temporary exclusion orders are aimed at British citizens suspected of terrorist activity abroad. Around 850 people from the UK have travelled to support or fight for jihadist groups in Syria and Iraq, according to the authorities, and about half have returned to the UK. 
Amber Rudd defended the low use of exclusion orders, saying greater efforts were being made to prevent people from going in the first place. She said 150 people, including 50 children, were stopped from travelling to war zones last year. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Emma Vardy. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. And we would like to recommend another of our podcasts. It's called Witness, and it's all about history told by the people who were there. First-hand accounts of some of the most important events which have helped to shape our lives and the places we live. There are five podcasts a week. In today's edition, we look back at the summer of 1968 when a young sociologist from Bihar in India decided to devote his life to improving sanitation and toilet facilities for the poorest and most oppressed communities in India. The clean and affordable toilet he designed went on to improve the lives of millions of people around the world. Rebecca Kesby has been speaking to Dr. Bindeshwar Patak. Search for Witness on your podcast app or go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. The chief executive of British Airways has defended the airline in the wake of the computer failure which disrupted thousands of flights worldwide last weekend, causing chaos for tens of thousands of passengers. Alex Cruz said a power surge was behind the collapse in BA's IT systems, and he said he would not be resigning but offered his profuse apologies to everyone who had been affected. Mr. Cruz said he rejected claims by union leaders that outsourcing IT to India was part of the problem. But Mick Ricks from the GMB union said he didn't accept Mr. Cruz's explanation. Why didn't uh, the backup uh, kick in? And basically because there has been an absolute brain drain out of the uh, company. BA, in the last 14 months, have sacked hundreds of highly experienced long-term served IT experts. I spoke to our business correspondent, Joe Lynham, and asked him if Mr Cruz and British Airways have said enough of an apology. They put out a video statement yesterday and the day before, but we journalists were not allowed to challenge him. I have been asking for interviews since 10am on a Saturday morning. Here we are almost three days later. We did get an interview. We were able to challenge him, but he didn't give us much information. He said there was a power surge and that the backup systems did not work. Now, that is pretty catastrophic in IT terms because giant organisations have a backup generator. And a backup generator to that again. They also separate the power supplies to their IT servers with different sources of power in case one goes down. And then there's the stuff like RAID, which is kind of the the rapid uh, response kind of system as well. We didn't get any detail about that. There's a massive investigation going to go on. He says he's going to find out why the backup system works. We'll get maybe more detail in the coming weeks and months. Right now, his priority is to get things back and up and running apologise to his passengers and try to restore some of the bad will that is now pervading. And is there a sense that this apology, we heard some reaction there, quite negative reaction about the sacking of IT uh, staff, but there's also the reputational damage. Is there more for the airline to do now? Well, there's a lot more for the airline to do. Remember, British Airways does not operate in a vacuum. It has to compete with the likes of Virgin uh, Virgin Atlantic and uh, Lufthansa and KLM and Air France. And that's just the kind of the European side of things. If you are a business customer, that is where the guts of your income comes from. They don't make much money from us going on short-haul trips from Britain to Italy or France, wherever it is. They make the money going to the Middle East or to Australia or to China, to North America. That's where the big money is. And if you think that you can't rely reliably get from A to B, you may decide to look elsewhere. So that is the real challenge, getting those people back on side, because right now they're offside. Our business correspondent, Joe Lynham. After raids by helicopter gunships, the army in the Philippines says it's largely in control of the southern city of Marawi in the province of Mindanao. The military says it now controls who enters and leaves the area, although the battles with Islamist militants are not over yet. The fighting began last week when the army tried to seize an insurgent leader. That led to martial law being declared by President Duterte, which provoked widespread protests. Our Asia-Pacific editor Michael Bristow is following the story. 
Well, it's still quite a confused situation. The army on Monday has said that they have got control of Marawi. They're controlling who goes in, who goes out of the city. They control most of the southern part of it, but they say there are still pockets of resistance, uh, Maute fighters holding out, and they're trying to flush those out. But that could take several days. So it's clear the army are winning, but it's not clear how long it will take to finally take back control of this city. Now, President Duterte's unusual and brash style has gotten him into some trouble during this period. He's been accused of saying some fairly inflammatory things, including making a joke about soldiers raping women during the course of the conflict. Yeah, this is from several days ago when he was addressing troops who were about to retake the city of Marawi. We appeared to imply that it was okay for them to rape women. Now, obviously, that led to massive condemnation, not least from Chelsea Clinton, the daughter of former President Clinton, who said rape is never a joke. And that argument has rumbled on. And even today, a senator, J.V. Ejercito, has told the BBC, we just have to expect these kind of things from President Duterte. Probably what the president wanted to show our soldiers that he will be behind them all the way. We just have to get used to the president right now. He is a colorful person. He's very unpredictable, but I think he still means well. We just have to understand that sometimes he just uses all of this as an expression. Now, the fact that it took the government almost a week to take back control of Marawi seems to imply that it's quite a difficult task they're facing there. It does. It implies a number of things. Firstly, when President Duterte came to power last year, he was promising to end all these kinds of insurgencies. And here we have just less than a year into his presidency, a big one on the island of Mindanao. It's also the lead insurgent group is a group called Maute. We'd hardly ever heard of them before. Now they appear to have several hundred fighters able to take control and hold a city for more than a week which shows their determination and their skill in fighting government troops and perhaps the lack of ability in government troops in able to kind of flush out these insurgents. So certainly it will be of some embarrassment uh, to the authorities that it's taken all this time even to get to this particular stage and they still haven't taken full control of the city. Our Asia-Pacific editor, Michael Bristow. The American whistleblower Edward Snowden has appealed for support for a number of asylum seekers in Hong Kong who hid him when he was on the run after leaking secret information in 2013. The asylum seekers from Sri Lanka and the Philippines were asked by their lawyers who were also acting for Snowden to help. However, it didn't do their cases any good. Their applications for asylum have been rejected by the Hong Kong government. Juliana Liu has been to meet them. These are good people who were driven from their homes uh, by torture, rape, uh, abuse, blackmail, and war. Uh, Circumstances that are really difficult for us to imagine, but these are documented. These aren't allegations, these are facts. That's Edward Snowden, the American whistleblower, asking his supporters via a video link to help the asylum seekers who fed and housed him when he was on the run in Hong Kong. He had just leaked thousands of classified U.S. documents and needed to disappear. Four years on, he is in limbo in Moscow. His former guardians are in limbo too. Their asylum applications rejected by the Hong Kong government. Yeah. What do you do yeah. yesterday at school? Things, I, I you... play. Yeah. I, I eat. Yeah. Vanessa Rodell is from the Philippines, and I meet her and her daughter, now five years old, in a tiny flat. She and the other asylum seekers protected Snowden at the request of the human rights lawyer, Robert Tebow, who was also acting for Snowden, and believed that hiding him in the crowded back streets of Hong Kong would buy crucial time. Now Vanessa is terrified of being sent back to the Philippines. I think if I go back to the Philippines, I will be shot. I will die with my daughter. So I don't want these things will happen to me and my daughter. Why do you want to join the CIA? I'd like to help my country make a difference in the world. Shortly before a Hollywood film about Snowden premiered last year, Vanessa and the other asylum seekers revealed themselves to the world. They had not told anyone about their role, but the director, Oliver Stone, found out about them and included them in the movie. The asylum seekers believe they've now become an embarrassment to the Hong Kong government. 
from the roof of their former apartment, Sapoon Kalapatha and his partner Nadika Nonis can look down on the jumble of alleyways which did indeed successfully hide Edward Snowden. From Sri Lanka, Sapoon believes his family's asylum application in Hong Kong was rejected because of its relationship with the whistleblower. We have the four different cases, uh, four individual cases, uh, and it's not apply same time, different time, but they took same time and they feel same time. The only thing in common these people have is that they all provided shelter to Mr. Edward Snowden. The lawyer Robert Thibault also believes the families are being treated unfairly. The immigration department singled out these people and had their cases expedited and screened, whereas all my other clients, and I have about 50 other uh, refugee clients, uh, their cases were not uh, called up for screening. The government denies this, saying the accusation that it targets any particular claimant or categories of claimants is unfounded. Despite her personal setback, Vanessa Rodell says she doesn't regret her actions. No, I don't regret helping Edward Snowden because I believe what he's doing is the right thing. And uh, for me, he's a hero and I'm very proud of him. The families have appealed against the Hong Kong ruling and have also applied for asylum in Canada. As an asylum seeker, Vanessa is prohibited from working, so for now she can just dream of one day being granted a new start for herself and her daughter. That report by Juliana Liu. International scientists are warning that some of the world's cities may be hotter by as much as 8 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. In a study published in the journal Climate Change, the research team says an increase in temperatures of this magnitude could have dire consequences for the health of city dwellers. Terry Egan reports the rise would be due to a combination of global warming and what's called the urban heat island effect. What is known as the urban heat island effect derives from the use in cities of concrete and asphalt as well as of cars and air conditioning. It means that more heat there is either absorbed or can't escape. According to the scientists from the Institute for Environmental Studies in the Netherlands, by 2050 the effect could add around 2 degrees Celsius to temperature rises caused by global warming in the world's most populated cities. These include Tokyo, New York, Beijing, London and Moscow. Just as important, though, is the economic impact of this. An analysis by a team of economists of nearly 1,700 of the world's major cities shows the total economic costs of climate change for the urban areas could be more than two and a half times higher when heat island effects are taken into account. Losses could amount to a tenth of the economic output for the worst affected cities by the end of the century and entail health risks, fewer productive workers and greater pollution. Terry Egan. Scientists in Britain have identified a new genetic cause of a rare childhood cancer known as Wilms tumour, which affects the kidneys. It's thought the research could throw fresh light on how all cancers develop in children. Helen Briggs reports. It's one of the mysteries of cancer, what causes cells to divide out of control, leading to a tumour. Now researchers have taken a step towards solving the puzzle, at least in the case of a rare childhood cancer called Wilms tumour. According to scientists at the Institute of Cancer Research in London, some cases are triggered by a faulty gene, which causes cells in the kidney to divide and grow abnormally. Unlike healthy cells, they end up with the wrong number of chromosomes, the strands of DNA that carry the genes. The discovery is expected to lead to a better understanding not only of Wilms tumour, but of other causes of cancer in children. It will also give parents valuable information about why their child has developed the disease and, in the long term, could lead to new cancer drugs. Helen Briggs. Police in the U.S. state of Florida say the golfer Tiger Woods has been charged with driving under the influence of alcohol. He was arrested in the early hours of Monday morning in the town of Jupiter in Palm Beach County and released a few hours later. Tiger Woods has been golf's superstar for years, but his career took a turn for the worse in 2009 following revelations about his personal life and a subsequent divorce. Julian Marshall spoke to Art Spander, a sports columnist with the San Francisco Examiner, and asked him for more details of the arrest. 
Apparently, he was at a party or having a good time with his friends. The police arrested him. All these things happened after 3 a.m., and I don't know what the circumstances were that caused it. But once again, he's in a small community in Florida where they know him. So either the fact that, wow, he shouldn't be doing this, and a lot of times they'll let you off, or, oh boy, we got Tiger Woods. <laughs> and uh, all I can imagine, and I've been dealing with him since he was at Stanford University, he's had a very tough couple of years. You've mentioned that Tiger Woods likes to party. Has that been the backstory, do you think, to his loss of form over the years? No, I don't believe so. I believe it's been all physical. He's never had any problems that people have talked about on tour. And, of course, one of the great advantages that Tiger has had over the years is he has this group, you want to call it a posse, you want to call it his friends, that protect him very much. So you feel that his loss of form is more down to physical problems? Absolutely. I mean, he always showed up and played, and the fact that he hasn't been able to play for a year and a half, he was really down. Now, here's what's contradictory. A few days ago, he said he's never felt as good as he does now. He's now, what, 41, and uh, as any athlete, his career is slipping by, and you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe he's feeling better because he had spinal fusion surgery in April. Yeah, and that was his fourth surgery on his back. And he also had a couple of surgeries on his left knee. All these things have to take a toll on you mentally as well as physically. I always think for baseball players, tennis players, cricket players, and golfers, your back is so important because everything revolves around that. And if you can't swing a golf club the way you're supposed to, you can't play the game. He was once widely expected to surpass Jack Nicklaus's record of 18 major championships. Is that going to happen? No. And I didn't think it was going to happen two years ago. In other words, once he made this comeback with his back problems and his age and the competition that's out there, I don't think he was going to win three or four more majors. The question now is, will he ever win another golf tournament of any kind? And uh, he, as we all, keeps getting older and the competition keeps getting younger. And that's a problem, as you know, in any sport. The athlete turns around and he sees somebody coming up to take his place. And while golf, you can really play well in your mid-40s, it's not a standard. You have to think, OK, a career is almost over. Art Spender, a sports columnist with the San Francisco Examiner. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News Podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Emilio Sampedro. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>